Like most airlines, Air Canada has seen its share of highs and lows, but in the wake of a near disaster, it seems to have been piloted to a turnaround. Air Canada took to the skies in 1937 with just three airplanes. The Crown Corporation was known then as TransCanada Airlines. For decades, it was an unrivaled giant. Until the turn of the century, after it was privatized and the airline hit heavy turbulence. Suddenly, there was real competition, but also rising fuel costs, the dot-com crash, the SARS outbreak, and the September 11th terrorist attacks, all of which would lead to this moment. The country's biggest airline made an emergency maneuver today, going to court to seek bankruptcy protection. Overseeing that bankruptcy was Chief Restructuring Officer Kalen Rovanescu. Then again, just six years later, he would steer the company away from a second bankruptcy bullet, this time as CEO. Today, Air Canada is soaring. Many credit Rovanescu's leadership, even though it has met tough labour concessions for 27,000 employees. In the latest conference call, Rovanescu said the airline has finally reached a new era. Record sales, record EBITDA, record adjusted net profit, record number of passengers carried, record load factor, best airline in North America for the fifth year in a row. I recently sat down with the CEO and those blockbuster numbers are where our conversation began. Well, 2014 was really, in my view, a breakout year for us. Uh, it was the culmination of uh, several years of uh, radical transformation, transformation involving our pension funds, transformation involving labor, transformation involving our cost structure and a lower cost vehicle. And so it kind of all came together in 2014 and I'm pretty proud of what the company's achieved so far. A long time ago I saw an analyst say there's a once in a decade opportunity to invest in airlines, every decade. Uh, in other words, they can be so troubled financially that on the other side of a restructuring there is this, uh, this upside potential. Is that what you're experiencing or is it bigger than that? No, it's much bigger than that. You know, what we've been trying to do is to build a company that is sustainable, profitably sustainable in the long haul. So therefore, we're not looking at the immediate benefits of uh, low fuel prices. We're not looking at the immediate benefits of consolidation in the United States. We're looking at a, at a company that is intended, in my view, to deliver sustainable profitability and not have this variation that we've seen over the last 20 years. So I think that's really what we're working towards. What are some of the steps you've taken that really do, I think you used the, the term um, immunize against some of that cyclicality. What have you done to change the cost structure? Well, first of all, on, on the immunization, we use that expression for the pension plans because what we used to have is, you know, we have a pension plan that is about $16 billion of assets. $16 billion. So if, you, if you're in a deficit position, $16 billion of liabilities. Yeah. And, and the volatility attached to the pension plans uh, is even greater than the size of the volatility attached to the airline. Airline has about an $8.5 billion enterprise value, pension plan $16 billion. So what we wanted to do is immunize against variation in interest rates, and so we've been matching uh, maturities of uh, bonds uh, with the maturity the obligations in the plan. So we're about 72.5% uh, now matched, and we had a uh, $800 million uh, surplus 780 uh, surplus at the beginning of this past year, uh, that's the current estimate. So it's worked really, really well, and we're well on our way to kind of eliminating the overhang that the pension creates. And then in terms of the cost structure, that, that's been a completely different chapter where we've wanted to build a uh, lower cost carrier that'll give us the, what we call swing capability, to use the airplanes one place in the summer and a different place in the winter, uh, offering a uh, vacation product, a leisure product. This is Rouge. This is Rouge, yeah. You make more money when people fly Rouge, is that correct? Well, it, we, the costs are lower. So we have about a 30% lower cost structure in, uh, in, in Rouge, and therefore the profitability could be greater. But you know, we have some you know, very, very powerful international routes, like to China, to Japan, uh, to other parts of the world, like that London, Frankfurt, uh, on mainline, which are also very, very you know, uh, profitable routes for us. When you, though, describe that the narrower body, there are more seats in the plane, uh, Rouge is a less uh, comfortable ride. I speak well, from experience. <laughs> it's not as it's not the same experience as in the main yeah. the main line. Uh, is that a problem for you? Does it pre present a problem? No, it's been one of the things we've been building is to differentiate in uh, the customers' uh, expectations what it is that Rouge represents relative to what Air Canada main line represents. And so Rouge is a leisure experience. And so when we fly it, and I've flown it myself to Greece, when we fly it, uh, it is different than what we have in main line. So I flew in the business class product in in Rouge, which is not a live flat seat the way we have in the main line. But it's a really uh, uh, competitive, and actually I'd argue uh, the best leisure product that's out there. 
And uh, that's really what we're looking to compete against, are the leisure airlines that will offer that. And uh, so far, so good. The load factor has been you know, off the charts. We've had about 3 million passengers that have already flown on Rouge. So uh, very, very pleased with that so far. So one of the things that Air Canada has done in recent years with its uh, fleet of planes being newer, uh, great planes, uh, than many of your competitors, certainly continentally, with the service that wins award after award, year after year, uh, is condition your customers to that kind of level of comfort and service. I wondered whether uh, you can educate them for a slightly lower uh, level of, of service and, and experience uh, and still keep them. Well, you know what we're doing? We're looking at some of the, the examples that exist in other industries, like the hotel industry. You'd have like Marriott is a very good example, which has got a suite of different products, including a uh, lower entry product. Yeah where uh, people will have a different experience when you go to that particular brand of Marriott as opposed to the JW Marriott or one of the you know, top end of the, of the uh, range. And so this is a subsidiary. This is a different company. And uh, it makes use of a lot of the Air Canada infrastructure. And we haven't wanted to really start from scratch with a clean sheet of paper because we knew that would be impossible relative to pension obligations and labor contracts and so on. So we're making use of the Air Canada infrastructure while offering a, uh, a product with, which obviously has more seats on the airplane and doesn't have uh, some of the other amenities, but has worked out really, really well because you can actually be more competitive price-wise you know, relative to what you could with mainline. One of the things that airlines have done in recent years that does drive some travelers crazy, although we seem to have accepted it as well, are the surcharges for luggage. Uh, fuel, of course, is sort of built now into our expectations. Is, will that continue? Uh, things that you might argue are part of your core business, right, right. Uh, but you, you managed to, you've conditioned us to accept them. I think it's been a long process, I'd say. It's been at least a decade that we started this whole uh, disintermediation of the airline uh, ticket. And, and the reason for it is basic economics. The airline industry generally, globally, all in, uh, delivers about a net profit margin of 3%. So this is a hyper competitive industry. And so what, what has gone on is that people will compete on the base fares and then say, start adding on to that, depending on what you want and depending on how you value that airline. And so you know, people value, in our case, our loyalty program, for example. So they might say, well, if all things are equal, if the base fare is the same relative to a competitor, but I like the Air Canada loyalty program, then I might be more inclined to go there. If I like the fact that I can choose or not to choose to, you know, to pay for a bag, if I don't have to carry a bag, if I don't have to check a bag, then I might just carry on and, and so on. So I think customers have that suite of alternatives available to them. We offer preferred seating now. So somebody wants that you know, special seat that has extra leg room, well, you know, that'll be... Uh, uh, and and this, these ancillary fees, industry-wide, have started to represent the lion's share of the industry profitability. I mean, this is a tough, tough business that, generally speaking, does not generate uh, the same kind of profits that you know, you'll, you'd see in the financial services industry or oil and gas in good times. And one of the tough things about this industry historically has also been uh, negotiating with your, your unions and, and making that partnership work. And we've seen different models of it in, uh, across the, the industry. Have you, have you licked that? I mean, when, you, when you ink a 10-year agreement with some staff, yeah. uh, what does that say about where you're at with your relationship? No, we're very pleased. That, you know, for us, we, we've embarked on a, on a strategy over the last several years of saying we're going to effect the transformational changes that need to happen even if it's unpopular. Having said that, one of our big uh, priorities, and we've made it very clear in every communication, is culture change. And uh, the fact that we were able to do a 10-year, come to a 10-year deal with our pilots, which is you know, often was one of our most difficult negotiations in the past, is a real culture change initiative for us. And so we're very proud of that. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, we have many, we have uh, five uh, different uh, union groups. That doesn't mean that, that it's always going to be smooth sailing with everybody uh, uh, else. Obviously, they have a job to do, and we appreciate that. Uh, and, uh, but I'm, I'm very, very uh, uh, optimistic, uh, I can say, based on what we've seen through that uh, pilot dynamic. So while last time we went through a very difficult negotiation, which led to binding arbitration and uh, an imposed contract and so on and so forth, uh, this time around we have a 10-year deal. I think everyone sees it as being win-win. Uh, we've managed to show our labor groups that as a result of some of these transformations, well, guess what? You know, we've had the most profitable year in our history. We're making a big payout to all of our employees under the profit-sharing program. The stock uh, was the number one performer on the stock exchange in, in 13 and one of the top performers last year in 14. So people start seeing the cumulative benefits of, uh, of some of, the, uh, some of the, you know, the difficult things that we had to do over the previous few years.
Air Canada seems to be a rare success story. It's hit some bumps, to be sure, but many of its competitors have been permanently grounded. Still, there seem to be plenty willing to enter the fray. Canada's airline graveyard is pretty crowded. The most recent to leave the business, Toronto Sky Service in 2010. Others include Zoom Airlines, Harmony Airways, Jets Go, and Canada 3000. Upstarts like Greyhound Air, Roots Air, and Royal Airlines tried and failed to get off the ground. They all had similar problems. They couldn't figure out how to keep revenue ahead of costs. Somehow that's not scaring off newcomers. Both Jet Naked and Canada Jet Lines are planning to raise $50 million each in order to launch this summer. They call themselves ultra-low-cost alternatives and promise ticket prices up to 40% below current offerings. Southwest Airlines in the U.S. is mulling an expansion north. Air Canada says it's ready. In the second part of my conversation with its CEO, Kalen Rovanescu, I asked how his long history with the airline has prepared him to lead it. I was the lead counsel uh, when the company was privatized 25 years ago, so it goes well beyond the restructuring phase and the uh, hostile takeover bid of Jerry Schwartz in 2000. And for me, even before I joined, Air Canada represented uh, something more than just another company. Uh, and I learned about Air Canada as a lawyer uh, when it was going through the privatization phase. It was one of the first uh, major privatizations uh, uh, ever done in Canada. And uh, we picked, you know, basically through that entire process, we developed a long uh, relationship. And I'd say it's almost like the uh, mermaid's siren call that I could ill uh, afford to uh, refuse when the time came. Is there something, though, about being um, a quasi-outsider to the industry, uh, not like your predecessor who grew up with this idea about uh, planes and running an airline, uh, that's made this job better for you? No question. Look, I, I brought different uh, skill set to it than uh, many of the uh, you know, folks who preceded me who, who grew up in the airline industry. Uh, and having had somewhat of an outsider's perspective helped as we had to you know, make some of the changes that we did. Uh, but, you know, this is... a uh, this is a company that benefits both from a lot of external factors and external talent and the people who've come up through the system. You know, and, and as I've said to so many of our employees, the legacy, the fact that this is a 77-year-old company uh, is a great asset. And let's find a way to convert that, which has always been seen as, a, as, as somewhat of a, of a burden. Let's find a way to convert that 77 years into, uh, into something that's dynamic. And that's really what's gone on here. Is we, sort of infused a sense of entrepreneurship into this 77-year-old company, and guess what? We've got some pretty good results. Including one that is uh, state-owned. How much of the remnants of that culture are Well, it's now a quarter you? of a century. It's now a quarter of a century behind us, and I'd say that uh, it's, it's largely gone, but there are still some remnants of it. You know, it goes to no notions of entitlement, goes to notions of you know, uh, employment no matter what. Uh, that the uh, uh, that that someone owes you a living, and of course, as we know, in the hyper competitive world that we operate, and especially internationally, uh, nobody owes you a living. And so that dynamic has taken a while to to sink in. But I'd say that uh, certainly right now, at this moment, the organization is uh, is fully appreciative of uh, how competitive the world can be. Having seen it come, uh, I mean, we literally once shepherded it through the process uh, near bankruptcy, and and then the second time coming perilously close to it. Do you feel as though you know where the pitfalls lie? You know where all the bodies are buried here? Well, we certainly know where the pitfalls are. This is, a, this, as I said, this is a, uh, a, you know, an industry that has a razor-thin profit margin when things go well. So when things don't go well, uh, it, you know, things can deteriorate pretty quickly. And so we've been careful to say, you know, what kind of debt level should we have? How much liquidity should we have? What is the level of tolerance we can have on the pension front? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So these are some of the things that'll say, you know, you mitigate the risks and you deal with, uh, you know, a notion of enterprise risk management, which is uh, somewhat more real than it is in many other industries. And on that front, you have new competition. Uh, you would certainly see entrants coming into this market, including some U.S. competitors. Is that a threat that is a, a one that looms for you? We, we look. We, we like we we like good solid competition that makes us better. And I and I say that's the kind of competition that. Uh, I'll take any day of the week. It's, it's the ones that often come from other state-owned enterprises, from other countries that don't, have, uh, don't really operate on the same uh, basis that uh, I would have exception with. But what we've managed to do over the last number of years is make ourselves more competitive. You know, we've gone through, I'd argue, a form of liposuction in terms of having some of the you know, costs come out of this uh, 
uh, vehicle and uh, and can compete. Rouge gives us a great tool to compete on the leisure uh, and leisure area. The 787s give us a tool to compete with a more effective airplane. We have these high density 777s, which uh, have 450 plus seats on them. Which give, so we've got different tools that we've put in that uh, we're, we're much more confident in, in terms of being able to deal with competition. And when you worry, what is it you're worrying about? Well, look, I think that this is a, an industry that uh, is affected by virtually any macroeconomic event. And so I'm worried about things that are outside our control. Things that are inside our control, I think now we have a pretty good handle on managing them. But obviously, you know, we're dealing with a, with, with a world where we've seen the gyrations in, in fuel prices. You know, we, yes, fuel went down, but then they were, went back up 20%. Uh, we, we obviously have uh, conflicts in many parts of the world, and, and we had the uh, tragedies that occurred last year with uh, several of our colleagues in Asia who uh, lost airplanes and so on, and we had the tragedy over Ukraine. Uh, you have a lot of macroeconomic and uh, sociopolitical events uh, that really do affect the airline industry. So, you know, we, we, uh, we keep our fingers crossed and manage the things that we can control and uh, hope that the rest of the world uh, cooperates. Is there a right number of airlines for this country? Look, you know, I think that there's the, there's lots of room for competition. I'd say that the, as the way the world has evolved, you know, we compete domestically with some uh, carriers. We complete, compete transborder with other carriers, and we compete internationally with virtually every carrier in the world who flies into North America. And uh, what has occurred in the airline industry generally, and I'm, you know, quite involved with the IATA, the uh, International Air Transport Association, what has evolved internationally is uh, a competition between hubs. And so you'll have you know, a hub in the United States, a hub in Canada, and a hub in the Middle East, and a hub in Europe competing for the same passengers, for the same traffic. So it's very interesting to see how that has evolved. And, and we really want to have uh, our uh, foot in the door to be able to win some of that business. And that's really what's going on here. Uh, there's going to be massive growth of uh, air travelers over the next decade. Uh, the IATA numbers uh, estimate going from 3.7 billion to 7.3 or 7.4 billion uh, travelers a year and so you, you're going to see massive growth not all that growth will be in, inside Canada so for us Canada is is an interesting market but that's not where the real uh, right. battles lie is there a part of this business that interests you the most that you find the most fascinating I find many parts of it stimulating uh, I have to say it I think now I'm at the verge of really uh, sinking my teeth into the uh, international battle grounds that are being formed and I find that uh, uh, a very, it's, it's a different competitive dynamic and, and contrary to so many other businesses you can't really have uh, uh, international mergers because of the ownership restrictions that exist in virtually every country uh, around the world and so you have different partnerships that emerge. You know, we have a large partnership with Lufthansa and United uh, Airlines uh, over the Atlantic. Uh, it's, it's de facto a merger of our activities over the Atlantic. And that has been a uh, uh, fascinating uh, alternative to doing a merger. Uh, several other carriers have got similar things going on. And uh, we're now, we announced we're looking at a partnership uh, along those lines with Air China for hmm. Canada to China business. And that obviously will be a, one of the biggest markets in the world. And uh, so that's a fascinating part of this uh, evolution, I'd say. And you're ambitious for Air Canada. We have a lot of ambitions because we think that uh, we, we can certainly be amongst the uh, leaders in the world in, this, uh, in, in the aviation uh, field. All right. We've got to leave it there. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much.